The thought of it. It's the ground and milk. I'm seeing it's possible to get some at home. <laughs> the thought of it just. Go up in the mountains. Yeah. Minnesota don't have mountains. Somebody said we're supposed to have a lot. Well, of they were talking about Minnesota. Winter. Yeah, that's what you said. Good little kids going to school. Yeah. Yeah. Just the on to see yeah. As we go into a private school. school. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I think kids should have to wear. That's uniforms. the subway over there. Yeah. One of our daughters' kids have to wear a uniform. Well, you know, I think that's great. I do too. What to is trendy? Women, zip up your purses, men, put your wallet in your front pockets. The magic Yeah. And then, did you notice how it starts? It stop, stops so it starts so quick. One time it's a luxury apartment, and then it's Harlem. Just now. Not gradual. Chinese don't have a mirror. Good TV antenna sticking out of that window. Uh, and the police department is in the kind of thing. See the little churches in there? Look at this. Just terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah. As we go over the bridge, just look down, I think, to the right, you'll see a lot of nice nice uh, sailboats and yachts that uh, are down in the harbor. This is the Newport Bridge, one in Newport, Rhode Island. Close your eyes. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can imagine when they ready to have the races, they're all fantastic, it really is. What kind of races? Sailboat. Is this famous for that? No. You have a lovely day. If you have any questions for me, I'm Miss Dubois. Good day, then. Thank you. Dubois. I can show you the way. She caught all that. The water closet is the same. Mason and Woodbury. And she told me the height is at 3. And then you get the sixth Cinema. Oh my, oh my, yes. Isn't that something? Then you can just push that button. What button? Yeah. No, 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 no. Don't turn over here. That red one? Yeah. Oh. And it's on? Yeah, it's on. We've got to wait and get some inside. Nice. Get something exciting on it. Winter, they came here and built their cottage. Waste the film. Okay, dear. Two in the middle, two in the other. And the youngest one, he's using this hair. Yeah, not shower anymore like he used to. Called Astor House. Huh? 
City of yourself, sir. I was saying this lady suggested that perhaps you could take over showing the guests about the home, perhaps the second floor. Yes, yes, I would be delighted to, to do that. I've shown them the first floor. You wouldn't mind? No, not at all. All right, would that be a uh, oh, very nice idea? Thank you for the suggestion. Hurry back. Bring your lady right. back with you. All right, I will. Yeah, we're we'll definitely here. try to. Yeah, so, we're, we're uh, it has been an honor meeting you, a pleasure. You've been a delightful group to show about the home. And Thank you so much. And Mr. Murray, thank you very much for your chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I turn around the bad time? I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, I will hopefully see you before the end of your inspection. So. Okay. Nice. Nice seeing you. Good day. Thank thank you. Good day. We'll see you tomorrow at dinner. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm Mr. Carl Murray, and I'm a valet to the Stewart family who's staying next door at uh, Mrs. Astor's guest cottage, Felicity. Uh, would you mind if I look upon you and speak freely? Yes. yes, no problem. Thank you so much. It's much better than looking at the floor all day. You know, <laughs> As I was telling you, I'm just merely a valet, but I certainly know all about the living quarters up here. And I understand it really helps quite a bit. But what she has done is she's taken all of these cards in here in this little box. She's put a number on it. And what she did is whenever the new gowns arrived from Paris, she also stitched a number in the back of the collar of each of the gowns, you see. So now instead of traipsing up and down the stairs, uh, trying to figure out what the lady's going to be wearing, well, she'll just look through her cataloging system here and pick the number on the car that she wants to wear, you see, because there's a description of the gown along with the accessories that go with it. Now all Miss Straton has to do is ask her lady's maid to retrieve the number she wants, bring it down, present it to her, and if it's the gown she wants to wear, well, then she'll help her prepare it, and uh, then Miss, Mrs. Straton, the lady maid, well, she'll tear up this car, you see, because the gown will never be worn again in the presence of anyone of her society, so she'll just simply tear up the car and throw it away. Now, oftentimes, the ladies, they will pass their gowns to their ladies' maids, like Miss Dubois that was out on the drive, 
that's the one I was telling you about. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she actually said that uh, her lady's maid, Mrs. Stewart, she passed her gown to her. She took off some of the lace and the beads and such and altered it to fit herself. She'll often make pillows and quilts and such as that as well. <laughs> uh, tomorrow evening, whenever you arrive, you ladies may use the dressing table here. Now, uh, there's uh, brushes and combs and such and pins. Uh, we'll bring in flowers. You ladies put flowers in your hair as well as feathers and things of that nature. And, and if you haven't had your arsenic for the day, you can take your arsenic as well with your tea. Right, have you ladies had your arsenic today? Yeah. That's poison. You're kidding me. <laughs> About the arsenic? It's poison. Oh, you ladies don't take the arsenic in your tea. <laughs> oh, yeah, so all of the ladies here, they take a spot of arsenic in their tea each day because that... We well, see, gentlemen, please excuse me, but the ladies, they have to wear some tooling around their midsection, keep some bit lifted, and sometimes it makes the blood rush to their cheeks. It seems quite unattractive to have that pink skin, so the ladies will take arsenic to keep the blood quiet down, you see. It helps the ladies with their complexion. I don't want to see some of you gentlemen are looking a bit pink yourself. Perhaps it's all their eyes. Well, they wanted, they wanted to see the servants' quarters. I suppose they're a bit progressive. I noticed some of the ladies were showing their ankles, so I suppose they're some. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, sir. Some of them wearing gentlemen's pants, too, I saw. <laughs> um, I think they're all suffragists, Mr. Masterson. Oh, very good, then. Um, well, uh, I think I'll be on my way. Oh, in, in truth, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Robbins uh, told me to mention that uh, uh, you should uh, deliver the post about the home. Oh, yes, I can do that. Very good, then. Good day, uh, good day, Mr. Masterson. Good day. Good day. Good day. Well, before I take you down to the, to, the, to the room that's my favorite, I can show you this is the children's playroom there. Now, all seven grandchildren don't fit in that room. They bring out the toys and they play at their governess and such. And, of course, the governesses stay upstairs in the servants' quarters where the lady domestics stay. And then uh, oftentimes the children get aired out twice a day, so perhaps that's what they're doing right now. They're aired out. Getting the aired out. And now this room here, this is Mrs. Lightfoot's room. Now, we of course, we can't all fit in there, but we can fit through. But, uh, Mrs. Lightfoot, she's the head housemaid. Now, Mrs. Lightfoot actually becomes in charge of the home whenever the Astor family leaves, because Mr. Hayde, the butler, and Mr. Uh, Felix Walker, and all of the, some of the other servants, they all leave, you see. So that leaves Mrs. Uh, Lightfoot in charge. I meant to say Chef LeBlanc, not Felix Walker. He's just a footman. <laughs> but uh, actually, Mrs. Lightfoot, someone was asking me today why she has no door in her frame. Well, that's because, as I was telling you, the lady domestics, they stay upstairs. So that leaves the male domestics downstairs. And, well, there's the staircase. And so she has to watch it quite well, you see. <laughs> she even, yes. And Mrs. Lightfoot, she even placed that mirror there quite appropriately so she could see from her bed to the mirror to the staircase as well. Oh. Have to watch out for her. She keeps a stern ship. And the oven is actually where they cook uh, vegetables or perhaps a, like, especially cakes and pastries and such or perhaps your turkey or your ham. You can put that down here. <coughs> this top part is called a range. And on the range, they can prepare some of your other meats and vegetables and things, or perhaps your tea. And they can cook that right here. And the most wonderful thing when Mrs. Astor did her renovations and she had gas attached to the home, she also had gas attached to her oven and a range. So all you have to do is strike a match and light on top and it will heat up like a fire. It's quite delightful. Up here, these are the broiler pans where they can prepare some of your other meats. Yeah, this pan, I saw, I saw, I noticed someone that noticing that uh, this pan was hanging here and said they could fry a good egg on that. But we see Olga, Olga, she's the undercook. You see when Chef LeBlanc leaves with Mrs. Astor, Olga becomes in charge of the kitchen. So this is Olga's kitchen now. That's why I wanted to check first because if we were caught in here by Olga, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Uh, because so we'll see Olga, she can fry four dozen eggs in this pan and flip it all with one arm. Oh. <laughs> That's all. You see this space in between the oven and the, and the table here? That's for Olga as well. We'd like to <laughs> have to watch out for Olga. Where is she? We'd like to meet her. No, you would. Oh, all right. <laughs> this is one of my favorite things in the kitchen. You may touch it if you like. It's called a zinc top table. You see, it's a bit cool right now. And what's yeah. curious about a zinc top table is they can take a boiling pot of water off of the range, sit it right here in the middle of the, the zinc top table, and it will heat the surface. You see. Uh, that way, all your meats and your vegetables and, and your hot things are start to you warm because they've been sitting on this table. See, it's the yeah. 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 And They can do the same thing with the table over there. And they can take a, a rather large log of ice, sit it right in the middle, and it will chill the surface so that your sorbets and your fruits and your salads are kept cool until they're brought to you as well. It's quite delightful. Actually, I mean, yes, yeah, certainly. He's got a BMW convertible, very expensive car. Yeah, really. Probably one of the asters then. Good. I have to ask about that Mr. Robin, would you have one That's the hot tub. 
from the Plymouth Rock. Fighting on the front, but they have something different on the side. Yeah, a lot of them do, I noticed that. It's a new front. Sleeping arrangements. We have a few cabins that represent what they might have been like down at the far end. And if you're coming down, some of you want to head the other way. It's a little crowded right here. If you're down here and you're on your own, you can go whichever way you want. Go carefully. You'll find many things exhibited. But it gets a little crowded here. You go there and then come back and you'll get another chance. You have the skill you build a little room. Much better than what we portray generally. Um, because if you portray big, bigger rooms, you could move around that way. Uh, or much cruder, just canvas curtains. But you do something to set the earrings to create order. That's the obsession of the 17th century, is order, order, order. Um, you're not just control. And that's the disposition of a helmsman standing from behind. And furthermore, you can see a, an additional mechanical advantage with the whipstaff. We, we've located this piece of wood over the hatch simply to prevent our visitors from getting their feet caught. But this wouldn't be here normally. But you can see this fulcrum-shaped object. This is what in the period is called a roll. And not only does it allow the whipstaff to pivot laterally, but it also allows us to descend the whipstaff a little deeper into the lower deck. You can see how much extension we get from it. Oh, and so as, as you work the whipstaff, you not only swing it from side to side, but you actually sink it a little deeper into the deck, which of course being attached to the tiller, further sweeps out the tiller and gets more manipulation and control of the rudder. Would, but, one, would one man work that? Or would as long as he can. The, the difficulty is, is, is such that as, as all three components are connected, so yeah. long as one is moving, the other is moving. And it see this whip staff swings like a metronome. Yeah. So the, the helmsman is not just okay. galling around lazily back here. But <laughs> no. We ate over there last night. Way over there. The our lobster. Hogs and cattle, and they hit more. They hit hay out there. <laughs> Anyhow, welcome to Ocean Spray Cranberry World Museum. We're just glad to have you here. This is the form of the headquarters of Ocean Spray. They are now 18, 16 miles west of here in a beautiful setting in a large area of bogs in our 
the processing plant is just south there about five miles. So this uh, was the beginning and our museum started in 1977. We'll be out of here in, in uh, this November into our new museum down here just a few blocks down by the Rotary Circus. So when you come back, it's going to be exciting and we hope you'll enjoy it because it's going to be more modern and everything. Ocean Spray itself is a co-op. We all know what co-ops are, don't we? It was started in 1930 and uh, it has grown now to uh, involve uh, five states and possibly eventually Maine, be uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, Oregon and Washington, British Columbia and also up in the uh, Montreal, Ontario area. Boston over there, the city. This is the Kennedy Library. No, I want to, this one I start buying. No, that's what was Tom, Tom, why didn't you? That's Logan Airport? <laughs> Must be, because the planes are going up. I said this in here reminds me of Crystal Cathedral. Yeah. Kind of how that's built. The flag up there. Did you get that on tape that that on Logan's? Yes, yeah, so I did. That Oh, wow, look at that doing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Woo! She's John Hancock building in downtown Boston. Oh, huh? I need a super one. I don't know. I don't know. I don't <laughs> I'd known that. Yeah, it's like being in an airplane. I've never been he's, in an He's never been in Oh, you haven't? Okay. Yeah. Believe it or not, I am afraid of heights. Okay. It's kind of like you get the feeling that... <laughs> At the extreme end of it, there are a picture of the building. We're underwater. For the next few minutes, let's imagine that we're back in the year 1775. We're going to descend to ground level, right here at the foot of John Hancock Tower. We'd be in the middle of a tidal marsh. The town itself is built on almost an island called the Shawnut Peninsula. The narrow strip of earth, Boston Net, is our only connection to the main. In 1775, Boston already is an old town. It's been about 150 years since John Winthrop moved over from Charlestown to avoid the mosquitoes and seek better water. The French and Indian War is already some 12 years past. The British price was high. And ever since, the Crown has tried to levy taxes on the American colonies, but without colonial representation in Parliament. In freedom. Nice room. It's the first time I've done a room, you know that? I should have did that rinky-dink one in, in um, New York. Was a very quiet affair. No emotional outburst, no fanfare. During her first few seconds of freedom, Howard was greeted by smiling with prison guards and a few cameras. It's the very best feature of a ticket. Are there any boards in these places? Yeah, bathroom's routine. USS Constitution.
the house just past it, the brick house, a little more modern looking, 1720. Coming back and moving up a little forward in history, come back to the wooden house from 1770 until 1800, it belonged to Paul Revere. And he lived there with his two wives and his 16 children. So, well, one after the other. <laughs> so, until 1800, Paul Revere owned that house. Here you see the anchor with the flag here. This is the Mariner's Society. It has We're in the line. Um, so that group doesn't get in front of us. Um, my wife is a nasty person. She brings school groups here and she promises them their next stop will be the Paul Revere Mall. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this area was cleared out back in the 1920s. It was slums and tenements and nasty little alleyways, but it was cleared to make a very nice connection between two lovely churches. Now, the church on this side was built in 1800, and it was built to be a Puritan church. Middle of the 19th century, though, what happened to the neighborhood? The Irish. St. Stephen's a Catholic, Catholic Church today. And if you want the history of Boston in one long sentence, why don't you follow me now? <laughs> no, hey, no cameras. I can video again. Nope. Oh, I thought it was flashes you couldn't do. It. No. Friend. I've been wanting this for days, you know. I said I wanted to get this to something live. Oh, sorry. I brought one of my two with me on the bus. Really? Yeah. Hi. Standard poodles. Oh, we would have done that. Yeah, right, guys. Lunch. We could have taken care of them. Yeah, that Esther Ford. Oh, yeah. And maybe we for duck one of my favorite books. But what is this? Yeah. There's more crowds here than New York. We need to, um... Look, down around the corner. That's not important. It's true. <laughs> Following the red brick road. What did you say about that, sir? <laughs> say that again. I missed it. <laughs> This is in the Guinness Book of Records. This is the only parking garage, to my no to our knowledge, in, his in, in existence, with street level entrance on four different levels. One, two, three, down around the corner, four. This is not important, it's just odd. <laughs> there was, back in 1919, a huge tank right in the middle of all the tenements and slums that were down here in this flat area. And um, it was up on stilts, and it held two and a half million gallons of molasses, and it exploded. A 23-foot wave of molasses swept through the streets of the North End. A couple dozen people were drowned in the stuff. Um, hundreds were injured. It took them weeks to pump it out of the cellar holes and whatnot and flush it out into the harbor. And they say that for 40 years, uh, the North End smelled sticky molasses smell on a hot summer day. It's called the Great Molasses Flood. And it wasn't really funny, you know. It was a very serious industrial accident. But it was a sticky situation for sure. <laughs> now you're going to see a little more of my favorite construction project. Very, very effective. Uh, now, on your left, you will see a lovely brick building. We're we'll going to be coming back in this area for lunch. This is called Faneuil Hall. It's also known as the Cradle of Liberty. It's been there for 250 years with shops on the first floor, public meeting rooms upstairs. It still functions the same way. Uh, we still have the public meetings upstairs and shops on the first floor. Up in front of us, on the right, you can see, and those on the left, yes. Uh, a lovely little gem of a building, the old state house. This is where the British governor had his headquarters before the revolution. It's English bond, by the way. 
a brick. Um, and as you as you look up, you'll be able to see, and you can see this later after lunch, we're coming by here. Um, we have at the top of the gables of this building, the lion and the unicorn, the symbols of the hated British Empire. And I can tell you in 1776, we ripped them off and burned them. A hundred years later, we put them back up because we thought they'd look nice. The balcony on the end, this end of that building is where, on July 17, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was read out loud to the people of Boston for the first time. The, the brick one that you're going to see as we're coming around the corner. And you're going to see this building again later. I'll point it out again later. But this is, the, look to your left, you can see the balcony I'm referring to. See, there's the lion and the... Now, the... Um, nice thing about that balcony and that story about the Declaration of Independence. On the 4th of July every year, we have a rereading of the Declaration of Independence from the same balcony at the beginning of the or 4th of July. That's the way we start the day. Very nice thing. Uh, this past summer, over that weekend, we had the future homemakers of America here. I don't know if you're